Welcome to that lecture online and now for the fourth of the four forces that control the universe and this is the gravitational force. Now in our daily lives this is probably the force we're most familiar with. Anytime you, anytime you throw up a ball it comes right back down due to the force of gravity. But at the quantum mechanical level, at the subatomic level, gravity has very little influence. And the reason for that is that it's a very weak force. The strength of the gravitational force is 1 over 10 to the 43rd the strength of the nuclear strong force. It's minute. It's also very weak compared to the electromagnetic force. And so to give you an example of that, if you remember in the previous video where we set two protons side by side, the force between them was 160 newtons, the force of repulsion, that was equal to about 36 pounds of force trying to push the two protons away from each other. Well, the force of gravity should be attracting the two protons together if we put them side by side. And since this is the equation that determines the force between the two protons or the force between any two objects due to gravity, m being the mass of the two objects, r being the distance between them, and g is that gravitational constant. And that was experimentally derived, and currently g is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. That should be an m right there, meter squared. There we go. So you can see by the constant alone, 10 to the minus 11, that's a very small constant. So what is the force of gravity between two protons put side by side? So let's say we put a proton here with a proton right next to it. Of course, we already know that the force of repulsion due to the electrical forces is enormous. But what about the force of attraction between them? And again, the distance between the two centers, that would be the distance, which of course we use the letter R for that, is equal to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. All right, let's go ahead and put in all the other numbers and see what we get. So the force would be equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. Multiply times the mass of the, the two protons, that would be 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And of course we can then square that because there's two of them, divided by the distance between them squared, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15 meters and we have to square that. All right, let's find out what the force would be in this case. And so we have 6.67 e to the 11 minus times 1.27, oop, oh, let me try it again. 6.67 e to the 11 minus times 1.67 uh, e to the 27 minus, we have to square that, divided by 1.2, e to the 15 minus, squared it as well, and we get 1.29 times 10 to the minus 34 newtons. Compare that to 160 newtons for the electrical force between them, the force of repulsion. So you can see that we shouldn't really say that there's no effect on the, at the particle level, but in essence, since it's so small, we can simply ignore it. It's insignificant. It's pretty well not measurable, the force of attraction due to gravitational forces between two protons being that close. So at any rate, you can see that um, gravity is at the subatomic level or even at the atomic level, insignificant, not important. At the large level, it's very important because it's the force that keeps planets together, that keeps the Earth going around the sun, that keeps the, the, uh, that, uh, the force that produced the, the stars and the galaxies and so forth that govern the universe at a large scale. Matter of fact, Einstein discovered that the force of gravity actually changes the shape of space itself. Einstein discovered that gravity even affects light. And that was a big mystery at first because notice that this equation, the force of gravity as derived by Newton, required that the, each object had to have mass. And so Einstein declared that, hey, if a, a beam of light passes by the sun, if this is the sun, the gravitational force caused by the sun causes space to bend around the sun and causes the direction of the sunlight to change. And so we knew that there was something happening to space around large objects like the Earth or the Sun. No one believed him at the time, but in 1919 he proved that, and so from then on we know that gravity is in essence something that causes the, the, the shape of, the, of space itself to change. So at the quantum mechanic level, we have determined that it must act pretty well the same as the other three forces in the universe. 
And so therefore, just like there's a force carrier between the electromagnetic uh, charges, which in this case would be the photon, they surmise that there must be something like a force carrier for gravity, and so they called it the graviton. Now, we haven't yet detected the graviton. We haven't been able to prove that it exists. We think it does. And also, there must be gravity waves. For example, if we could take uh, some very big tweezers, grab the sun, and shake it back and forth, the gravitational field around the sun should therefore also be wiggling back and forth. And that wiggle should then permeate itself through space in the form of gravity waves. So another thing we've been trying to do is detect the gravity waves. Now that's a very difficult thing to do, in part because gravity waves don't occur at the level that we can easily measure it. There must be an enormous amount of mass that must be displaced very, very quickly. And of course, in a laboratory setting, that would not be possible. So what we have to look for is something happens in the universe. For example, a supernova explosion has the ability to move large quantities of mass very quickly, accelerating very quickly in a very short period of time. And that should cause gravity waves that we should be able to measure. And how do we do that? Well, we set up what we call a wave interference experiment. And we have two of those, one in the state of Washington, one in the state of Louisiana, where we're trying to measure gravity waves by having a very large solid object that should be affected by the gravity waves. And we should be able to detect a shift in the wavelength caused by the gravity waves bouncing off of that big object. Now, the problem is that the gravity waves are assumed to have a wavelength of about 1 times 10 to the minus 20 meters, which is about 1 100,000 the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. So you can imagine they're very, very tiny waves and very difficult to produce. And so we're relying on gravity waves coming in from far away from the universe and being able to capture that in, in some fashion. We haven't been able to do so yet, but we're hoping in the future we'll be able to, to, uh, to fine tune our instrumentation to the point where it's actually possible to measure gravity waves. So gravity is probably the most, the most understood from an everyday of experience kind of force, but the least understood from a scientific point of view. We haven't been able to figure out what a graviton is if it exists. We haven't been able to show that gravity waves exist. And we haven't been able to really understand what that means in terms of what is the connection between the change of the, the space caused by mass being placed in space, causing space to bend in the four dimensionals, uh, in the four dimensional space, and we haven't been able to tie that in with how gravity works at the subatomic level. But give us time, things that we didn't think were possible 100 years ago are possible today. So one day we probably will be able to figure out what gravity waves are, be able to show that they exist, and we probably will find something like a graviton.